I am Zunaira Azhar and you're watching Epicenter, where we discuss, dissect, analyze, and try to understand major domestic and global stories. Last Monday, uh, the Foreign Office of Pakistan confirmed that an intelligence-based operation has been carried out by our security forces inside the border region of Afghanistan. Uh, that killed almost eight Afghan citizens. However, uh, the development was not very surprising given the fact that ever since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, TTP has ramped up attacks in Pakistan, something that the Taliban government has constantly denied. Pakistan has tried everything. Talks with TTP, domestic counterterrorism operations, border fencing, and even expulsion of the thousands of Afghan refugees, nothing has worked. Uh, the question is, if we are slowly sleepwalking into another perpetual state of war, this time on our own, because the world has moved on. Um, Afghanistan is becoming a strategic liability for Pakistan. This is the question that people are asking, uh, something that we have to answer and face one way or the other. To discuss this, we have been joined by Fahad Hussain, senior journalist and political analyst, and uh, Mr. Mohammad Malik, who is also a senior journalist and a political analyst. Thank you, both of you, for joining us. Uh, Fahad, uh, we have a very uh, love and hate kind of a relationship with Afghanistan. And uh, it's really complex to describe it here, but I won't dive down into what crisscrosses have been involved when it comes to the uh, Pakistan's Afghan policy. But do we have a clear result now? Well, I think uh, the resolve has already been displayed I, when um, um, we hit targets since inside Afghan territory. I think that was a huge step, uh, not just uh, going into Afghanistan, and uh, taking out uh, TTP targets, but also acknowledging it publicly. Mm -hmm. We've, we've uh, done this um, on previous occasions also. Um, we know you, um, at that time, the government of Pakistan never actually said anything. This time around, the, 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 I think the major difference was that they were able to acknowledge it. And acknowledging it publicly means that they are saying this is not the last time we are going to do this if uh, such acts of terrorism continue to emanate from, from uh, Afghan soil. So I think it has been a major step for Pakistan and I saw, uh, on the basis of uh, information that uh, there was a, lots of debate and discussion about how to uh, manage uh, this particular uh, initiative, uh, if I may call it that. And I think ultimately the decision was made that we must, um, we must not hold back, otherwise uh, the, the message that we want to communicate to Afghanistan will not be relayed as clearly as, as we would like to. So clearly, a Rubicon has been crossed, and I think there's no turning back from here. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Malik, same question for you. Do we have a clear resolve now? Because retaliatory strikes have been happening in the past as well. Only this time it is more public. It is coming from the Foreign Office as well. But uh, uh, it's not changing. Nothing is changing in Afghanistan because there is a report out there that says that even Al-Qaeda is getting foot foothold over there now. So it is ISKP, it is TTP, it is uh, Al-Qaeda already there. Do you think that we are back to square one when it comes to Afghanistan? Yeah, so the resolve is clear, declared. I think Pakistan, it was inevitable. Pakistan had to do it. Mm -hmm. And now Pakistan needs to hold the line, uh, despite what Zabiullah Zabi Mujahid and others are, are, are making very strong statements. But, but there is a certain reality on ground. Now there's an impression that's being given is as if the Taliban have been lying to us about everything. It isn't the case. Uh, when the Taliban came into power, one of the first issues that Pakistan raised with them, and this I'm talking about, I'm privy to, to a lot of uh, things that happened behind the doors. And uh, I've been covering Afghanistan since 90s, even when the war of Mujahideen was going on there. And I was amongst the first three journalists who entered Kabul when, when it fell. So I have a pretty long uh, field experience over there. That's what I'm saying. Now, Taliban made it very clear to them that it's not easy for us to, to rein in uh, Tariqa Taliban, Pakistan people over there, because they owed it to them. They said that when uh, Daesh and others were, were raising a serious challenge against the Taliban in, inside Afghanistan, 
TTP people fought along, alongside them. Yeah. And one of the senior most leaders, when I was talking to him, he said to me very plainly, he said, Malik sir, how can we betray our friends when they need us and uh, when they fought alongside us when we needed them? So that is their way of thinking at one level. Forget about other groups and other money uh, interests and all that. This is the core understanding. So even when um, during the last government, you might remember when I did this incident earlier also, um, Hwaja Asif along with DGI went to, went to Kabul. They had meetings and a lot of things were discussed. So Taliban asked them for about 15 billion rupees to, to at least move the families of TTP people away from, from the border so that the Pakistan army could deal directly with the fighting side of the thing and not uh, take on families as a collateral damage or something like that. That thing happened, progressed a little. I believe about five billion were paid out also. And then it fizzled out. So it's a multi-layered thing. And like you just said you're now yourself, that again you see a rise in Daesh, Al-Qaeda and everything. So the Taliban government has a lot of internal challenges. So it needs a lot of internal support from wherever it can get. TTP is giving its support to them uh, in their own internal strifes. So I, I think it's becoming increasingly complicated. That's why the strike was very important. Mm -hmm. And the message was very clearly given to Taliban that, you know, no matter what your internal issues are, either keep them inside Afghanistan, but don't let that, those guys allow, don't allow them to sort of uh, spill it over into Pakistan. Yeah. So this was inevitable, but it's not as simple or as uh, single dimensional uh, as it looks. Right. Uh, Fahad, uh, according to a report that is being published in Foreign Policy magazine, Al-Qaeda is back on ground and it is actually thriving, it says, because it is back to, um, uh, the, it says that it is back to the masterminding of the 9-11 type attacks and the terrorist group is running militant training camps, sharing the profits of Taliban's illicit drug mining and smuggling enterprises. If this is the situation, and then there is a resolve from Taliban that because TTP is our brothers, they have been our foot soldiers, we cannot attack them. That is not our problem. The problem is that, that they are getting back to their old tactics. And that is going to have a spillover in Central Asian states, Russia, China, everybody is concerned. How Pakistan is going to manage it alone, all alone by itself? Well, clearly, uh, uh, Pakistan uh, should not be managing it alone, but uh, as far as terrorism on our soil is concerned, uh, I think uh, it is absolutely clear that, uh, that the primary threat is from TTP, which is based on Afghan soil. So that much is clear, number one. Number two, um, as Malik Saab was saying, I agree with him that I think the Taliban, uh, the TTA, Tehreek-e uh, Taliban Afghanistan, have said repeatedly to Pakistan that even wanted to cooperate in terms of uh, dealing with uh, TTP, uh, they either don't have the willingness or the capacity, and in some cases, both. So to expect the TTA to actually take any action against the TTP is almost uh, an impossibility. That's not going to happen. So whatever Pakistan has to now um, calculate in terms of its policy options, this uh, option of TTA um, doing anything as far as TTP is concerned is, is, uh, is no option. Now, what does that leave Pakistan with? One option was the one that we exercised, which was to actually go in and hit TTP and tell um, the Tariq Taliban of Afghanistan that if, if they're not going to do anything against TTP, then Pakistan will. But the question then is, how effective would these strikes be? If, if we, the strikes that we did last week, are they going to diminish the, the threat of uh, terrorism emanating from, from Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, or partially no, then clearly we have to figure out what else we can do. Now, in terms of what else we can do, there is a debate. And only last week, um, uh, when um, uh, I was speaking to Khaja Asif on my show, he said that there are a number of other options on the table. Obviously, Pakistan will not... Uh, spell them out uh, clearly. But with the rise or, or the resurgence of, uh, of Al-Qaeda, the situation will become all the more difficult and then add one more complicating factor. That is the PTI government in the province of KP. We heard Mr. Imran Khan say last week uh, that 
Pakistan's attack on Afghanistan was not something that he he supported. Mm -hmm. So so and we've always known uh, his and his party's policy towards TTP and the softness that they've always maintained. So having a PTI government in KP at a time like this will complicate matters further. So I agree with you. I think the challenge for Pakistan uh, is mounting by the day. Uh, Mr. Malik, uh, a comment from you on what uh, Fahad has rightly mentioned, that if the dimension um, <coughs> of the policy is totally different in KP or the dimension of looking at the facts is totally different in KP, how does that add to the resolve that we are currently witnessing? I think one of the reasons we see Imran Khan or, or the KP government adopt a different approach is because they're not, I know they feel that they're going to face the brunt of it. And that is where the terrorism is happening. So it's only natural for them to try to take a more moderate approach where they say, let's have talk, talk first and fight, fight later. Whereas Islamabad or Pindi might be more keen on talk, fight, having at the same time. So I understand the reluctance or the softness, as, as far put it, uh, towards a particular group, but not that it has paid off in the past. There, 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 again, there are more than one angle to it. You see what happens is, that what about the, the religious extremism ecosystem inside Pakistan? Mm -hmm. This is what feeds groups like the Tariq Taliban, Pakistan and others to melt into the, you know, sort of melt into the society, become a part of it and, 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 and hide within plain sight. Now, we keep seeing different groups emerging at a different time. First, we had Hafiz Said Saab and uh, his, we were told, you know, his is only Kashmir agenda, He's not a religious extremist and all that. But we saw those groups, they're all joined at the hip. We saw TTP and those guys working in tandem at one time or another. Now we see another group, TLP, being uh, uh, nurtured as a new religious group in Pakistan. It's already it's a formidable force. Who stops them from tomorrow uh, being joined at the hip with Taliban for whatever pretext? How did Tariq Tariq Taliban Pakistan start? It started off as a religious extremist group. And then it had created its own nationhood of uh, Islamic State and its own separate thing. While we are hitting uh, people across the border, we have to be very careful what we are doing inside our borders also. Are we nursing new terrorist, uh, uh, religious extremist groups? Yes, we are. Are we supporting them or tolerating them and suffering them? Yes, we are. Are moderate religious parties being pushed to the sidelines? Yes, they are. Let's talk about Malala Fazlur Rahman. In ANP, you had, you might have, I'm, I have a million differences with Maulana Fazlur Rahman, but he does represent a moderate religious viewpoint. His space has now been further taken over by, by extremist groups over there also. And his demolition in elections reduces his, his uh, influence significantly. You might want Maulana Fazlur Rahman <laughs> out of the power corridors for political reasons. What about the space? that his party loses in that moderate religious things also. So it's not that Taika Taliban Pakistan works in a vacuum. It has its own culling fields in Pakistan and there are many factors contributing to it. Yes, kinetic action is brilliant. You go in, you bomb, you hit, brilliant. And I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. If your officers and your jawans die, there must be a public open response to it. But you, how many strikes are you going to do inside Afghanistan? Yeah, that's, are you going to declare an open war? That's Obviously the you paradox. That. Yeah, that, you need to look at the factors that are inside Pakistan. They, they might be more difficult. There are more difficult choices to make than the choice to strike against uh, 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 across the border in a country where the government is not recognized by 90% of the world. It was an easier choice. Mm -hmm. The more tougher choices that need to be did, uh, uh, taken are inside Pakistan. Okay. And that's where the problem lies. Okay, Fahad, I agree with uh, what Malik is saying, that there is an internal uh, twist to extremism and then there is an external element. But of course, what we are talking now and what is at hand is what is coming from Afghanistan. And as you mentioned uh, earlier, Mr. Khaja Asif, the defense minister, has also war warned that we are going to block their uh, corridor, the trade corridor as well, if that's been needed. So uh, does it mean that slowly we are... Uh, uh, gradually going up the uh, upping the ante in a way or is it climbing the escalation ladder or is it carrot and stick method what are we doing exactly I think it is all of the above the ones that you mentioned um, 
what is very clear is that uh, our traditional policy towards Afghanistan has turned more muscular. There is a greater level of aggressiveness. There is a greater level of um, uh, of acceptability to 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 take a take more kinetic action. I think there is a greater uh, space and also uh, a, a greater level of uh, intensity in terms of how we want to uh, deal with TTP. We know that we followed a failed policy of trying to speak with the TTP. That happened for when a the long PTI time. government was in power. Uh, absolutely, the PTI government was, and uh, and the, the the military leadership uh, was speaking was not only speaking but actually. Um, trying to convince everybody that at that particular point, speaking with the TTP, making some sort of a peace with the TTP and resettling them back into Pakistan was the best policy option. There were a lot of arguments given by uh, the leadership at that time in favor of this policy. Um, and one of those arguments was that this is the only way that we can actually convince them to disarm themselves and become part of uh, the, the civilian population in Pakistan. We all know how that worked out. Yeah. Now, the fact is that because of that wrong policy, we are at a stage where the TTP not only has um, uh, um, a proper um, space in Afghanistan, it has the full support of the TTA. Uh, it is also being used as a proxy against Pakistan. And it has hundreds or thousands, we don't know, of people who came back into Pakistan were resettled mm -hmm. and are now possibly involved in either terrorism or sabotage um, or or even aiding uh, or abetting of, 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 of Pakistani population. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, so one failed policy has led to um, a stage where we now have back and try and figure out what to do. We have lost time. We have lost. We have lost the initiative. And we have lost so many precious lives. So I, for, for one, um, can completely understand why our policy is becoming more muscular. Mm -hmm. um, the appeasement didn't work. So now, obviously, uh, the muscularity of policy is something which is an orga organic extension um, of our previous experience. The bigger question is, what do we do with this muscular, muscular policy? One manifestation was an attack. But of course, one kinetic action is not enough. It has to be backed by muscular diplomacy, muscular policy initiatives, more muscular regional initiatives, all the things which can somehow enable Pakistan to overcome this challenge of terrorism, which only a couple of years we thought that we had actually overcome. Yeah. So, so I think it is now a huge challenge for the new government and the military leadership together. All right. Well, Biden administration is always and still under a lot of criticism whether it was a right moment to leave Afghanistan or not when they left in a very shameful way. This is, I'm quoting from a magazine. Uh, when we come back from the break, we'll be discussing the congressional hearing that is still having some ripple effect in Pakistan. Although we discussed it at length in our last program that this is normal business in US. Let's talk after a break. Welcome back to Epicenter once again and the congressional hearing in which Donald Liu has categorically said that everything that has been associated to him um, in context of the cipher is all lies. But the hearing had um, other caveats as well that people are discussing, independent scholars are discussing, and there are major takeaways from that hit hearing that people are discussing. I would like to take um, uh, the views of my uh, panelist on it, Fahad. People say that there was a flip side to that hearing. There was a clear message to Pakistan that we are not going to highlight the election rigging a lot as long as you do not get cozied uh, with China anymore. And then there was a hint of Iran there as well. And then there was a mention of rigged or irregular elections as well. So what kind of a balancing act it was from US? We'll come to the PTI part later. Well, I think, um, uh, I don't think it was a balancing act in, in, in the sense that whatever Mr. Donald Lu said about 
um, Iran and Pakistan uh, or whatever he said about um, Pakistan's relationship with China, none of it was new. This is stated American policy. They have been saying forums to different people in different contexts, but the core message remains the same. I think the new thing which we were all looking forward to was what um, Mr. Donald had to say um, about the elections uh, and of course about the, the cipher. So I don't, I'm not going to read too much into the <coughs> Iran comment. Um, clearly, it is something that we already know. What Mr. Donald forgot to mention, perhaps deliberately, was that Pakistan now doesn't have a choice in terms of going ahead with the Iran gas pipeline because there is a legal dimension to it. Uh, and had we not uh, continued um, or restarted uh, this pipeline project, we, Iran could have gone to court and, and, and there was a lot of uh, debate and discussion about uh, the legal position uh, of Pakistan in, in this context and the, the advice that was ultimately given by the law ministry to the government of Pakistan was that we have a, w a very weak case and if we, are, if we are found in breach of contract, then we could face very heavy reparations. This is not the first time that we've had to pay very large amounts because we couldn't go ahead with our international commitment. So I yeah. think we are, in a way, legally locked in a pipeline. And I think, the, obviously, the Americans know that very well. Uh, and yet, um, I have to say that they are against, uh, against the, uh, us participating in the project because you know, of Iran's relationship with, with the US. Same for China. Mm -hmm. Same, uh, you know, they've been saying it all along. So to me, at least, I don't think that was something that I would pay a lot of attention to. Yes, their comments on elections are important. All right. Uh, Mr. Malik, how do you look at uh, the testimony that we all keenly observed <laughs> this last week and are still discussing? It made interesting television. Uh, but before I co comment on that, I just want to make one comment on what we were discussing before, before the break mm -hmm. on Afghanistan. I, I think plainly put, the problem lies on the other side of the border, inside Afghanistan, but the solution lies inside Pakistan. And the solution has to be found here. Hitting okay. that is a, is a good action, but it's not the solution. So that's what I want to say over there. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, I totally agree with Fahad, because there are no surprises. And, and on the Iran thing also, I think there's a really interesting fine line. I was talking to some experts involved with the project. And they said that our, our liability is to construct the pipeline take it to the border. Constructing it and taking to the border and the gas flowing through the uh, two sides is something different. I believe the Iranian side has already done the construction on its own side. There are certain international sanctions on it and everything. So there the pa Pakistan is a bit protected in many ways over there. It has a case to fight. It did not have a fight, did not have a case to defend if it did not construct it the pipeline right up to the border. So I think Pakistan has no option, but it's still in safe legal waters on the other side. And uh, I totally agree with Fahad on the, on the Chinese things. It's already known. What people usually forget, Zunera, is that Biden was the vice president for 48 years under President Obama. Yeah. And he had been dealing with Pakistan. And he doesn't have good memories about it. Um, I've talked to various army generals who, who interacted with him during those times and everything. And he has a very strong uh, trust deficit when it comes to the army leadership and his dealing with Americans. He was convinced all along, he always has been, that, you know, we were told something else. They were taking our money, but they were playing uh, hooky with, with the Taliban and others and blah, 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 and all that. So he brought a lot of bias with him. Uh, when he became the president, and we've seen it happening. Mm. So I don't see anything surprising when, when Biden administration acts in a certain way. And Biden already had his pretty uh, firm views on Afghanistan and very over keen to get out of it and all. So nothing is surprising. As for election results are clear, very true. I don't think democracy is really an issue for any uh, American uh, political dispensation. Mm -hmm. Democrats like, are history bound. They have a habit. They always sort of talk more about democracy than the Republicans. But when it comes to really ground practice, it's always what works. What is a more convenient uh, setup to deal with? So yes, there will be talk. There is talk. He made all the right noises. But I don't think there's anything alarming for Pakistan as if, you know, 
there's a big, very sensitive democracy index. And if the Pakistan has suddenly come down on it, I don't see it as any, I think it's more of talk, really. I don't see it more than that. Okay. Uh, I'm discussing this more on a basic level so that the audience can connect to it. Because a lot of time, Fahad, uh, people do not understand how the global order works. Uh, at times, there is a lot of talk, but that is just talk, and there is no walk alongside it. And that is exactly what Michael told us in our last program, that this is very routine matter uh, as far as the U.S. Congress You see is that concerned. happening in Gaza? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, do you think now PTI is going to move on um, all this cipher narrative and all this conspiracy narrative? Is it, is it going to die down or they are still going to cling to it? Well, they're going to cling to it despite knowing the fact that there's nothing to it. It was a big lie at that particular point when it was actually uh, brought out or rolled out. Um, and it has remained a lie. It has proven to be a lie again and again. Um, and there is not a shred of truth in any of the any of the grand conspiracy theories that uh, Imran Khan, Mr. Imran Khan, and PTI have woven. Will they let it go? Of course not. That's not how their politics works. Even today, now they are saying that well, Mr. Donald Lou is a liar. And if you remember, uh, for me personally, I think it was a it, it was a matter of grave shame when. Um, uh, Mr. Donald Lou said that he had been receiving death threats, that his family had, be, had been receiving death threats. So this is a kind of a, uh, a political um, narrative that we are talking about. PTI is going to cling to this lie for as long as they can. They have continued, they, they have already started saying so at the, at the highest level. Chairman, uh, Barrister Gore, who, who said that, you know, there was, the, their, their, their narrative was grounded in truth and then Don Lu was the one who was actually lying. So it is sad, it is unfortunate uh, that that's what it is. But I think if there is any silver lining in all of this, it is that everybody else except PTI supporters know that this entire conspiracy theory was one big lie. And I think that gives me hope that ultimately this lie sh should die its own natural death and be buried. But I will never let it go uh, because uh, they still feel that it continues to serve its purpose. And if nothing else, it continues to fuel its uh, own support base, which clearly have um, too much respect for facts. All right. Mr. Malik, what is your opinion on the PTI dimension of this hearing? I don't think it's a matter of what PTI would do. I would rather put it like that. What would any party do if it was in the same position as PTI today? If your top leader was jailed, if your top leadership was in either, either hiding or being forced to change loyalties or your party was in a disarray, there's inter intestine fighting going on in the party leadership and everything, you would hang on to every little shred that came your way. You know, it's like it's like uh, being swept by flood waters. You hang on even to a little tree branch that comes your way. Yeah. And you try to make it count. So I, I think they would hang on to it. While these things make very interesting subjects of discussion Advice. for us and uh, for academia to dissect, I don't think on ground it's going to have any impact on anybody changing their opinion or loyalty. So there will be debating points, but every PTI chap I know still feels that, uh, you know, Americans did a, they pulled a fast one on them. They don't want to look the other way. And similarly, the other guys are iron cast in their views also. So yes, there will be a lot of talk about it, but I don't think PTI is going to lose any of its World Bank or any of its people. And besides for people, the bigger issues are not what Donald Lu said. Mm -hmm. PTI's bigger issue is its confrontation with Pindi and all that things happening and what is happening on ground. It's, it's a side, it's a, it's a side show. Yeah, so the narrative war is going to continue. Let, let me just is... quickly add here uh, one thing, if, if you allow me, Zunaira. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, think the, uh, I, the, I think there is more to it than just um, um, holding on to a lie. I think PTI people have, um, or PTI leadership, has actively um, encouraged a radicalization of such views. The fact that Donald Lou and his family are getting death threats is in itself an evidence of that. And if I, if I take you back a couple of years, when this original theory was, was dragged out uh, by PTI here in Pakistan, 
propagandist like Dr. Shirin Mazari, for example, I'll name her. She's a propagandist. She endangered the lives of journalists when she said that went and visited the U.S. Embassy, even for social engagements, were part of this conspiracy. So it is no. people like she, uh, Shirin Mazari uh, and her ilk who um, I would hold directly for this radicalization, for, for injecting an element of violence, for fueling lies and endangering the lives of people. This is not only irresponsible, I think it is reprehensible. Yeah, and it is taking us nowhere above all. Nobody is getting anywhere. Nobody is getting anything out of if it. If anything, the country is suffering the polarization, the kind of toxic material that we come across, the hatred. It is enough uh, when we talk about TTP uh, to look into your own you know, introspection stuff. All right, thank you so much, Fahad Hussain. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed Malik. And uh, when we come after the break, we will be discussing some crises in Gaza, which are mounting to genocide now, and the world conscious is still sleeping. Stay with us. And welcome back to Epicenter once again. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has made an appeal to the world uh, not to give up on Gaza as uh, the Israel is gearing up for the new invasion in Rafah. Now the question is that which world is he talking about? Uh, there is no humanitarian aid, uh, there is no international law in place. And it seems as if veto power is taking precedence more and more as this conflict is, uh, conflict is evolving. Um, we have with us today Pakistan's permanent ambassador to UN, Ambassador Munir Akram. And we would discuss this with him that what is happening to the world order? Uh, where is this conflict going? And above all, where is the moral compass of the P5? Uh, ambassador Munir, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm asking you as a common person, as a citizen of the global world, uh, which actually is witnessing something which is very unprecedented. At one hand, there is no access to water. There is a famine in Gaza. On the other hand, there are constant appeals for ceasefire, but nobody is listening to it. There is this constant veto being abused in Security Council. What is going on? is going on, I think, is very clear. Uh, there is a extremist, uh, basically rogue regime in Israel, which refuses to listen to the voice of humanity. Uh, it is not true that nobody is listening. The whole world is listening. The whole world is has a consensus that there should be a ceasefire. Uh, but Israel and the present leadership of Israel is the one which refuses to accept uh, the ceasefire and, and is impeding humanitarian assistance to, to the people of Gaza, is following policies which the International Court of Justice has described as plausible genocide. Absolutely. That is the problem. Yeah. So we, we, have, we have to find ways to convince the Israeli regime. And it seems that even their closest allies have not been able to convince them mm -hmm. to stop, stop the war and, and to prevent further uh, civilian fatalities, and massive killing that has taken place in Gaza. Uh, so we, the world has to focus on how we should take action to oblige the Israeli regime uh, to listen to the voice of the international community. Right. You've been very vocal about it. We, we can see it sitting here. We, we are very proud of what Pakistan is doing um, under your leadership in UN. Uh, but the very liberty, the very democracy in US seems to be challenged because 
uh, in Washington, there have been massive protests against their own government. But the Biden administration doesn't seem to be much budged about it, and they continue to support uh, Israel because probably it's their strategic liability or whatever the case may be. But how do you look at it? At one hand, you're supplying weapons, and at one hand, you are trying to uh, send troops to, you know, just airdrop the food and basic necessities. How do you look at it? Well, as you know, uh, America is a big power and a very complex democracy. And sometimes their policies um, uh, can appear to be contradictory. Uh, they obviously are allied with, the, with Israel and have extended full support to the Israelis without, uh, without condition. Uh, at the same time, they have been trying to um, convince the Israeli leadership to uh, halt the fighting, or at least ameliorate uh, the conditions uh, of the civilian population in Gaza. But it seems that they have not been able to convince their ally. So it is a question of the tail wagging the dog in, mm -hmm. in, in this, this situation. Uh, and, but, you know, I, I come back to the fact that it is the Israeli leadership which is responsible and they must be held squarely accountable for, for, these, for the crimes that have been committed. Hmm. People across the board are convinced that what is happening in Gaza is genocide. And uh, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the stats, uh, if you listen to the people who have been airdropping the aid, they say that it looks like an open graveyard. Do you think with the invasion in Rafah, uh, if the whole conflict continues, let's say for another month, there would be still a two-state solution on the table? Who would be there to accept it from the Palestinian side? Yes, uh, this is an a, a, a important issue. If uh, Israelis actually uh, extend the operation coming to Gaza, uh, into Rafah, uh, it is likely that there will A, be a, a, a huge number of civilian casualties because the Palestinians have sought refuge there, they are crowded there, they have nowhere else to go. Uh, it is possible that some of them may be obliged to cross into Egypt uh, and into the Sinai. Uh, and that will evoke a response from the Egyptians, uh, which is uncertain at the, at the moment. Um, but whether, you know, the, there is a possibility of a two-state solution, as you know, the Israeli Prime Minister has rejected yeah. a two-state solution solution. He has not accepted a two-state solution. It, it is um, the rest of the international community has been trying to convince them to accept a two-state solution as the only way towards a sustainable peace in, mm. in, in the region. Um, but they have not accepted it. So their objectives, from the way I see it, is to exactly, is to push the Palestinian population out of Palestine in order to create a majority Jewish state. Uh, that, is the, that is what their strategy seems to be. Uh, and we have to stop that. Uh, and, and, and to stop that, I think we have to take uh, important political, economic, and other forms of action in order to disincentivize the Israeli leadership from the course that it seems to be pursuing at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, it, it is, of course, ceasefire is the first thing. Uh, humanitarian assistance is, is, uh, is the second uh, uh, thing. But then we also need to think about accountability for the crimes. Absolutely. Uh, we, we need to think uh, about the penalties. Uh, for the Israelis for for having uh, pursued this uh, plausible genocide. Uh, uh, there is a, a question has been raised about Israeli membership of the General Assembly uh, of the United Nations um, the, uh, about setting up tribunals to try, try people responsible for the crimes. Uh, but at the same time, 
I think we have to create the preconditions for a two-state solution. It should be made irreversible. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that is to admit Palestine as a full member state of the United Nations, so as to create a legal, uh, a, a legal uh, environment uh, which would make the creation uh, of a Palestinian state on the ground uh, an inevitable reality. But even uh, the dedicated UN agency for the relief of Palestinian people, refugees who are scattered everywhere in Middle East, uh, they have been compromised. They have been politicized, rather. And uh, I, how I look at it is that uh, let it be humanitarian assistance, let it be peacekeeping. Everything is at a halt at the moment. Who do you think is the key player that can convince Israelis to stop right now? Well, I think it's very obvious the key player is the United States. Uh, it is the United States which provides economic, uh, military and other assistance to Israel. Uh, it is the United States uh, which has sustained uh, Israel through the years in mm -hmm. the economic and technological development. So it is obviously the United States which has to play the major role uh, in reversing the policy that the Israelis have adopted at the moment. Okay. But Ambassador Munir, tell me something. With the uh, presidential elections approaching, uh, Arab Americans are quite offended by Biden administration and Democrats are quite uh, worried about this vote bank that is differing away from them. Do you think that election is going to have an impact on what moves U.S. might make to clinch a uh, ceasefire? Well, as you know, the Biden administration and, and President Biden, from all reports, uh, seem to be under considerable pressure with, uh, from within the party, uh, from the from the left wing of the party, if you will. Uh, they seem to be under pressure, obviously, from the Muslim population uh, in America, mm -hmm. uh, and and they have tried to to adjust their policies in response to these pressures, internal pressures which they are facing, and therefore have moved from completely opposing a ceasefire to uh, at least offering a ceasefire. I mean, the U.S. resolution yesterday was yeah. voted and was, was vetoed. Yeah, by, by Russia and China. By Russia and China. Uh, but the Arab group also is a, was opposed to that because they did not think that the adjustment made by the U.S. in its policies uh, on, on this war uh, was sufficient, that the, the ceasefire call was still linked to the release of hostages, and therefore it was not considered what is required, uh, which is an unconditional ceasefire at the moment. So the Americans have tried to adjust their policies in response to domestic pressure mm -hmm. and international pressure, but they have not been able to come to the position which the rest of the membership of the UN is asking for, which is a complete and unconditional ceasefire at this time. Thank you so much, Ambassador Munir Akram, for your time. And um, well, this is the state of affairs of the world. Uh, we, uh, our sentiments, our prayers, our best wishes are with the people of Gaza. This is Zunair Azar signing out from Epicenter.